Welcome back, everyone, to Tia Know the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. In which, right now, let us do another focus, shall we? So, last time we did a lot of this political stuff down here. We got through all that good stuff, and unity is strength, and a new Italy before the world. And right now, let's go ahead and do pipelines for oil, even though there was one comment saying for me, say we should invest in France, which isn't a bad idea. Which actually really isn't a bad idea. But I'm going to get down here as fast as we possibly can. Get through this and then maybe do the mission to Bordeaux. The Ente Nacional Hidro Cabori, also known as the Six-Legged Dog, is his unusual logo. It's so much more than a company. With Enrico Matai, both president of the ENI and governor of the Governato del Golfo, the firm acts of our longa manos in the Middle East, protecting our interests there and fueling, both figuratively and literally, the Italian economy. From its new headquarters at Abu Dhabi, the ENI directs a political landscape of Arabia with a small of its own and many, perhaps too many, bribes. I love bribes. <clears throat> While Matai's methods may be unorthodox, it's undeniable that he's brought home results none had ever achieved. Should ENI fail or fall, it will bring an entire economy with it. Therefore, the government must ensure that the president and governor is given all the due support to further support pursue Italy's interest in that troubled region, of course. We expect a sizable revenue coming from it as well. Followed with, let's see, Path of Prosperity, Road to Social Justice, Path of Prosperity. While traditional industry and oil production makes up for most of our businesses, it's becoming clear by the day that technology is a new economic frontier. Every week something new pops up, everything else done before paling into, or paling in comparison. New production methods, engines, computers, weapons, everything progresses so quick, it's even difficult to know whether it's technology or some sort of magic. The path to prosperity, therefore, lies in the new field of electronics, physics, and experimental mechanics. Our Minister for Economic Development has drafted an incentives program to encourage the birth of startups. Um, uh, small but highly innovative firms where selected teams of scientists and engineers experiment with the latest inventions, bring the future a bit closer every single day. Very cool. Very, very cool. And Path to Prosperity. And cut the red tape, probably. There's still too much red tape in Italy's economy. All these burdensome regulations make it expensive and troublesome to conduct business, stifling Italy's economic growth. No more, the time has come to cut the red tape and rip out these burdensome workplace regulations. This is boosting economic growth and allowing Italian companies to create even more jobs. Sure, some may complain that this will inevitably result in more workplace accidents and injuries, but sacrifices are sometimes necessary for the greater good. <clears throat> we lose a little bit of stability, we lose a little bit of milk of population, get more production efficiency cap, which is quite bueno. And wow, well, this stuff in a few months, which is not bad. Also, I think LBJ got a second, uh, yeah, second term. The WMD bill, huh? I suddenly played as M uh, LBJ. I've not played as him yet. I am a man. Well, what if I don't want to be? Let's see. They are our past. Visit the bill. Through the state of healthcare. Reintroduce the idea of social security. Unity above all. Huh. Break with the Democrats. We're, all, we're going to have to pay for this all somehow. Our p duty to the people. Our duty to a country. Social Security Act, huh? Pressure the states. What if we... If I were to play as America and get like... What was it? Healthcare. Healthcare for all. But don't do Social Security. That would be kind of wild. Path to prosperity. And nothing there. Nothing there. Still 47%, which is not too bad, but not too great. And let us with do... Wait. Wait, what? Wait, why did it cancel? Did it cancel? Wait. Oh, did something else happen? Is there something else in the focus tree here? No? Huh. I don't think I pressed enter when I selected that. I'm pretty sure I didn't. Well, that sucks. We just lost a few days. A few weeks, probably. Huh. Maybe I did click it? Maybe I did click something? I don't know. I really have no idea. Prospect in Palestine? Well, how's Palestine doing? Unknown reserves? Well, I'm about to do that, right? Improve Italy. Well, Albania, small reserve discovered, no further prospecting available. We've done a lot of this stuff already. This is really done really we've done really, really well. Prospecting, regional finders, further develop South Sudan, sure, why not? Sudan will always be a part of us no matter what happens, right? They wouldn't want to break ranks with us. And actually, how are we looking for debt? Oh, let's boost, let's cut, let's cut. Nice. Just a salary, <clears throat> a moral welfare. How about that? 
Well, first, a necessity in any civilized country is not an economic issue, it is a moral issue. How can any country call itself truly civilized and prosperous when its citizens cannot make ends meet? Therefore, we shall be setting up and expanding an extensive welfare state for Italy. Healthcare, unemployment benefits, pensions, education, housing, you name it. You've got it. We'll be opting for a corporatist model that incorporates some private actors in the system so that everyone in society is contributing to make Italian welfare the best it can be. So, maybe we didn't skip something. Maybe I'm just going crazy. I'm probably just going crazy. But a just salary. Italian workers for years have demanded the most basic of human dignities, namely a fair day's pay and for a fair day's work. After all, how can one expect Italian workers to do their best and be productive when they are working for the starvation wages? Well, the workers have spoken, and we have listened. We've enacted legislation settling a minimum wage for all Italian workers. The workers of Italy shall be happier knowing that they shall be rewarded with just a salary, with a just salary for a good day's work, and happier workers a productive worker. Stability, max factories, production efficiency cap. Cool. Oh, and we can do this again. Oh, 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 a lot of things are happening. We can improve Italy, but I'm not sure what that does, so. And we did that one. Let's go down. We did that one, too. Um, actually, there's not too much down here. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, well, maybe there's quite a bit. Okay. It is 69. Very nice. Very nice. Let's see. Anything else here? Don't really care about that stuff. Oh, we didn't finish our line doctrine. What the heck is wrong with me? And then after this, we're going to go with this one as well. Sub standardized bombing formations. Ah, yeah, we're definitely probably going to hit 100 billion by the end of this episode. <clears throat> but yeah, that was weird when Germany went to war with Bulgaria and just kicked us out. Someone also recommended that we go back to, like, go visit Bulgaria. That'd be kind of nice. I wish we had Greece with us too, but, you know, just wasn't in the cards. Alright, so what is this? Okay, we get three synthetic refineries. I I'm okay with that. I like that. Adjust salary. Sounds pretty good to me. Hopefully that sounds pretty good to you. Very good. And the road to social justice, which is a great magazine from America in the 1930s. Italy is a prosperous country. However, the prosperity of our glorious nation is unfortunately not even distributed. And far too many talents live in crushing poverty. This shall not do at all. Thus, we are investing heavily in social programs meant to level the playing field, making it so that every Italian has the opportunity to rise to the top, regardless of the circumstances. No Italian should be going hungry in a nation as great as ours. We shall be a true meritocracy and a just nation. Just as a, was it Father Coughlin or something like that? Wished. We're actually 95%. We're doing much better with this. So, when I played as Scorza, I switched the leaders around for the Progetto Alpha. And, uh, that might have screwed us up actually by switching things around, so... I didn't touch this guy at all, which you... Look, I don't touch guys, but, you know, in general, like, I didn't move him around. So, maybe that helped out maybe a little bit? Maybe, maybe not? So, I don't know. We'll see. And I guess since we're here, it's 60... Well, it gets 68 done already. Uh, I guess we'll do a ship then. Uh, let's do this. Battleships. So, yeah. Looking pretty good. We got half over half a billion in debt. Oh, my goodness. I don't think so. And what do we have over here? Test to work. I think it's going great. And we have some coffee, too. And adjust salary will be done within a week. Oh, look, oh the Burgundian system's coming back. We have a sliver, like 1%. U.S. Japanese... Oh, please don't end in nuclear hellfire. <clears throat> oh, there it is. Faustino Garibaldi. And, of course, we saw all these yesterday. Not bad. Aldo Moro. Canavero. Canvaro. <clears throat> the Road to Social Justice. And the World Shall Call. And then after this one, we'll do this one. So, and for too long, we've isolated ourselves, believing all answers can be found in our colonial empire, and look how it just had ended. A stagnant economy and rampant public debt. <coughs> just like warriors and athletes, our industry is be risk becoming obsolete without competition against worthy foes. We risk disappearing into history. Merely one of the average developed countries. No, Italy will not fade into the dark. If we want to remain an economic power, we must extend the scope of our trade, no longer limiting ourselves to our sphere of members, but bravely facing the world face to face. Il mondo si chiama. Huh, Italian involvement. The empire is in crisis. Already the fragile web of regional alliances and power sharing agreements have begun to fall apart in the midst of sweeping waves of radicalization blowing across the Middle East. From the dunes of Dubai to the docks of Alexandria, discontent simmers from just below the surface, ready to put ruin to everything we have built ever since the Great World, Second World War. 
The main news arrives from Stirrings in Yemen. The Sultan is a skeptical ally to her ambitions of Bass, and yet he will still crucial piece of the web that held together at the Empire, his son. The reigning monarch now faces the culmination of years of mismanagement and heavy-handed suppression and revolt. More distressingly, the sentiments preached by the Yemeni rebels under the Republican Abdullah al salal have been met with acceptance across the Middle East. Even the most optimistic voices have little to offer besides increasing or report shocking reports. Whatever is to come next, we must be ready to break to be braced in the face of Oh, the coming storm. The winds have changed. Oh boy, that is not good. Alright, time for Dan and Oman. The region of Dofar has been a thorn long been a thorn in our side. Harboring insurgents and other insurrectionist bands threatening a position within Oman. And more than by the recent revolution in Yemen, it seems that the insurgents have stepped up their activity and began po posing an increased threat to our influence. Our efforts to suppress these insurgents have long been stymied by the isolationist tendencies of Sultan Saeed bin at Taimur, and it has become clear that no to maintain our position, he must replace. Thankfully, his son Kabus has proved proven to be talented and ambitious in equal measure and is more willing to offer his blessing and crushing the rebellion should we succeed in maneuvering him into power. Our garrison in Muscat has already drawn up plans for a coup d'etat against the aging sultan, and all that remains to see is executed unless we allow the specter of Ba'atism to infect yet another nation. So... Ah, intervening in Yemen. I love intervening in Yemen. It gives us purpose. <clears throat> now this time, I think the last time I actually sent helicopter divisions, so we can't do that this time. Which is fine, whatever. Go and stop training. I'm going to take you guys out. And... Uh, who's their tank general? A panza leader. Harsh leader? I kind of like the harsh leader. Is that it, though? We got a harsh dude. Level 4 attack is not bad. How's a harsh person? It's level 5. I gotta go with this guy, then. Alrighty. Ah. Very good. Now, do they have planes? Yes, they can send up to 80. It's not too bad. Where are our planarinos? Well, maybe we'll just build some new ones then. If we have enough. Jet fighters, jet fighters. Oh, I don't think they have... Oh, I got quite a few extra ones. Oh, we only have 12 of those guys? Good lord, we need to make more. Mm, 17. We'll do it like that. And then cut it down by... There we go. Let them go on. And then come down here. At the very least, we will have air superiority, which is a good thing. But, at least things are falling apart. Ooh, if you'd like to read about better industrial equipment, please go right ahead. This pretty much happens every campaign. More resource, efficiency gain, construction speed, uh, output, excellent. And goring. Oh, goring. They have no plans, which is good. So, we'll see what happens. Once we get our tank down here, we should do relatively okay-ish. As long as these guys don't fall too quick. Oh, crud. Insurrection in Oman. Oh, boy. Uh, let's see. Caboose! Caboose! You need someone, Caboose. And, I just want to go by the highest attack. There you go, Giuseppe. Wait, no. I already have Giuseppe. Uh, you. I don't care who you are. Alright, so can we send planes down over here too? Oh boy. Um, no. Oh boy. Well, I'm glad this isn't Italy falling apart yet. But give it time, give it time. Uh, we can just one more. We might only need... Okay then, we won. Nice job. All road to lead social justice and the world calls? Yes, please. And after that, then we'll probably go ahead and do a mission to Bordeaux if we can. The French have suffered considerably at the hands of the German Reich. We thought it could not get much worse after Himmler's uh, fanatic split Paris in half in chaos of the German Civil War. However, most of France came, itself came under control of the Black Sun, leaving only Rome state with the Bordeaux as its capital to be led by the Frenchmen. We must now decide our policy with regards to the France. They are utter abjection to the tragedy to the French people may yet prove beneficial to Italian interests. We choose to pursue a policy of cooperation with the government of Bordeaux, helping the regime build up our, to our benefit and bringing them into the Italian sphere. Alternately, we can use the weakness to undermine Bardell further, working with the resistance wherever it may be. To restore a free France, one incidentally would be firmly in our debt. That would be quite, quite good, I would say. Quite good. Alright, so, can we beat these people up? I'm all about beating people up. We still don't have an airbase. Hmm. Good to know. 
We beat him up. We like beating, beating them up. And maybe this gives more army XP, hopefully, actually. And good. Very nice job. Let them go into there. No, oh, come on, guys. Just kind of hang out for now. And actually, if we have to, we can do this, too. Just because the tanks tanks are pretty good. They're not the best thing. Obviously, I would prefer choppas, but that's all right. And I'm going to do that guy, too. What else do we have here? Booth Southern Sudan. Southern Sudan. Why not? Sounds good to me. Oh, let's go down there then, yeah. That'll help out. That'd be better. Uh, oh, we actually have to help out there then. That's fine. Because these guys are in circle, which is not good. Crush them. Well, at least we're helping out one area. That's nice. So then budget boost. Boost it up. Cut it down. Spend. Uh, I'm going to not cut the military spending for now. So that's good. Oh, good job, guys. Good job. Now I'm going to wait for the other guys to get up to the line because we're not going to lead the charge into there. Oh, very good. Look at that. Nice. Let's go do supply chain reinforcements. Nice. The roll calls and the mission to Bordeaux shall begin. Oh, boy. Ceux sont as digne de Bordeaux. Ceux la Bordeaux as digne Rome. Influencing the French. The hungry fox. Detente. La resistance. Infrastructure. Fishing rights. Okay, that's not too bad. Protection for the Francophile minorities. What do we want to do? We'll draw them into our sphere. Italian brigades. Uh, Treaty of Rome. Forts. Marseille. The blockade of Marseille. What does that do? Uh, I think I might go to the left side because it seems like this one's a little more aggressive for them. Threaten sanctions against them? No. I think I probably want to go to the left side here, so. Maybe we'll do this one. While the Free French in West Africa may claim to be the legitimate French government, it's obvious that the De Gaulle's band of castoffs and deserters won't be making their way back to Europe anytime soon. The government of Bordeaux, the one with actual control over parts of France, is still quite clearly the leg legitimate state. As part of our efforts to bring France into our sphere, the foreign ministry shall issue a statement reaffirming our recognition of the Bordeaux government and denouncing the pretenders in Abidjan. This will serve as a signal on our part, letting the French know that we wish to better improve relations between our two states. Sure, we'll go with that one. Alright, so since you're already doing that, that'll be good. And just go straight down there to them. We should have enough speed to do that. Well, of course, this is a desert. I don't know how, tank, tank, how well how tank, tanks can do relatively okay, maybe near the desert. Just don't get encircled. There you go, we won. Alright, yay! Good job, guys. Good job. And now we can get that back. Nice! And how are we voting? Did Egypt leave us already? Oh no, they did not. Let's go look at this. Still not too bad. Very, very nice. So, no crisis, no crisis. Fake news, fake news. We are doing okay. And look at our subject states. I love it. Heavily associated state. Ah, good. Now, we're not expanding as, as much as I'd like to, but that's just because we've been improving ourselves quite well, I would say. Good job, generals. Good job. What else do we have? Experience industrial stuff. Uh, mission to Bordeaux, entering Bordeaux. As motorcade entered the outskirts of Bordeaux, Ambassador Domizio del Gallo couldn't help thinking about how much he would have loved to visit the city under more auspicious circumstances. As beautiful Lancia Flaminia, the mainstay of the Italian ambassadorial corps, looked almost out of the world as it passed through the overgrown dirt road, cutting the enormous refugee camp. Thousands of desperate men, women, and children have fled the Burgundian invasion only to find poverty and despair in the view of the Gothic cathedrals obscured by the thick smoke coming from dozens of campfires and wood uh, stoves. With a sigh, the seasoned diplomat focused once again on his task, personal, personal feelings and the pity couldn't distract him from the orders he'd been given, and he would see, see them fulfilled. With Goring's Germany on the warpath once again, Italy needed allies, and what better ally than someone who hates the Germans with their entire being? Convincing France to join the Italian effort to contain the Reich would be easy, but Domizio knew that turning hate for what 
that for a common enemy into something more meaningful than that immediate. Finally, a scar stopped in front of the Hotel de Ville. Once aboard the town hall, now poorly equipped HQ for an equally poorly equipped government, interrupting him from his reflections. Ambassador del Gallo was used to much better, but it would have to do. As his driver opened the door, he plastered a courteous smile on his face and prepared himself to meet the French delegation. The storm was coming, and all of Europe needed to join forces if it wanted to turn the tide to destruction. The barbarians that once devastated the Roman Empire were now preparing for an encore, and Domizio would be at the forefront of the resistance. Bonjour, mes amis. Mes amis. I don't know. I, I took one year of French, and honestly, I can't remember a single thing of it. Except Monsieur. And, let's see. Hmm, I can't remember anything anymore. Ah, uh, yes. We should improve our two relations between the states. Yeah, I can't even remember what my name is. I know El Garçon. Oh, it was Je suis. That's right. Je suis my real name, which I'm not going to tell you right now. <laughs> ah, the Arab War. Oh, we don't need to do that anymore, so that looks not too bad. So, cool. Thank you. Thank you. And 98 billion. 98 billion. I love the OFM. Sorel Latine. France and Italy are Latin sisters. Oh, bonded by shared linguistic and historical ties, while we may have had our differences in the past, there's no reason for old bygones to interfere with future cooperation. In the spirit of our shared heritage, we should begin overtures to Bordeaux, enticing to stray out the shadow of the Germans and their stagnant economy, who had left them to fend for themselves against the tender mercies of the SS. Italy shall offer France a place in the growing markets of the Mediterranean, a prosperous future away from the failures of Hitler's Reich or Himmler's madmen. Italia class. Ah, battleships forever. Even though I should probably be doing, like, tank stuff as well, but whatever. We didn't really get that much arm XP now, did we? Kind of sucks. That's alright. Everyone train. We need more arm XP. Uh, what do we have here? Ah, yes. Improve Italy. We will do eventually. Fund the project 99% of the way there. I love it. And then we've got to test our work, too. Soon enough. Soon enough. Well, might as well improve Italy, right? Because I don't see Algeria, Albania, Transjordan, Croatia, East Africa, Greece, Kuwait, Iraq, Libya, North Sudan, Oman, Palestine, Persian Gulf, South Sudan, and Yemen. Influencing the French. Test the work. Very good. And let's go ahead and do this one. Very good. Anything else here? Nope. Yes. Good. Very good. So, Bordeaux. Like the creeping grapevines that once dotted his countryside, Bordeaux grew on him. After some time. Even in an atmosphere of utter misery where refugees were more common than residents and where hunger and poverty reigned from a rotten throne, there were a faint glints of hope that still surprised the ambassador whenever they sprung out of the city's mute muted suffering. Negotiating with the French Rome government was not always an easy task in this age of extraordinary danger, however. With a newly reunited and increasingly militant Reich looming ever larger, cooperation was of the utmost importance. Domizio del Gallo no stranger to hard bargains. After all, he had earned spurs in the increasing unstable world of Alanthrop and watched Italy rise up to seize a dominant place in European politics. French pride was something he had not come up upon previously. Long hours and sometimes days would go by without any serious progress towards detente, spent in arguing over semantics and impossibilities. And still, every day the chants of La Marseille grew louder and more numerous than those of Mar Marshal Nouvelle. Del Gallo could see with his own two eyes that the French nation was in shambles, but it appeared to him that the French spirit was crucially not yet lost. When the time came, France and Italy would replace the resurgent Reich hand in hand. At least he, ho he hoped they would. If he did his job well enough. Oh, crud. Order collapses in Egypt? Well, crud. No one warned me about this. What the garbage? Uh, well, shouldn't have spent all the political power trying to improve Italy. So we can't send volunteers. Um, Muslim Brotherhood, why? Oh, the 13 socialists. Okay. Advanced cannon sizes, woof. Man, I just want to send some volunteers. Well, so much for Sudan. Oh, we, oh, we joined the war. Come on, guys. Let me join the war. I need to help you out, son. <laughs> uh, after this, I mean, well, I won't do a focus just because I want to get stuff in there. Crossing this is Nanjing. Pray they survive. Strike at Fiat. Oh, no. Oh, no. What happened? No, we weren't fast enough. No, they just... No. <laughs> You're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart, man. Ah, oh, Egypt, no. 
The city of Turin woke up to another day of work. The most important industrial center of northwest, it, northwestern Italy prepared to see the, the trams go around the city, filled with men and women heading to their jobs, and the smokestacks starting to emit their dark columns of smoke, and the middle and upper classes were heading to their comfortable jobs at the many, many factories of the city. And yet, this is not another day of work. A strike of fiat workers was scheduled for the day. Per se, this was not a rare occurrence. Numerous strikes have been held during the summer, usually starting and ending in the open span of 24 hours and controlled by one of the major trade unions. CGIL, CISL, and UIL. And yet this time was different. Inside Fiat, tensions have been rising for a long time. Dissatisfaction with trade unions viewed as bureaucratic, inefficient, and all too eager to compromise with employers was creeping among the workers, and the continued prosperity of Italy seemed to bless everyone with its golden touch, except the many workers uh, the working, cla working class of families of Turin and other working class cities. Running commodities became more costly, and yet wages remained the same. The working hours were long and extenuating, and contracts were always at risk of being rescinded for mysterious and inscrutable reasons at the whim of those sitting in the offices upstairs. Frustration turned into resentment, and resentment quickly became anger when Fiat announced that numerous contracts would not be renovated at the end of the year, resulting in many workers losing their jobs. When the strikes began, it took everyone by surprise. Fiat, the largest car company of Italy and one of the most important in the country, ground into a halt. The strike spread like wildfire to numerous other factories across the rim. It became clear that it wouldn't end a dumb. In the span of a few days, numerous impromptu workers, organizations, and committees were formed, declaring an all-out strike. One of the most important industrial hubs of the country was shut down. Of course, the police were quickly mobilized to prevent the strikes from turning into riots, and the trade unions surged to retake control of the situation. For now, the air is tense, and nobody knows how the situation will develop. We can surely talk this up. The election in 1969, though. As the second ever Italian general election draws near, campaign season has begun in earnest. Advertisements for the vast arrays of parties, often done using whatever means can be found, are seen <clears throat> throughout the country. Most of the annoyance of the Italian people. The battleground for control of Italy has remained relatively static since the previous elections, largely such as DC, the predicted favorite of the previous party or previous elections. The leftist coalition FD and the conservative BN all face off once more for the majority. Although the incumbent coalition is certainly favored to secure the second term as a majority government, analysis has stated an upset victory for the current minority party or parties is currently within the bounds of possibility. As hundreds of thousands of Italians shuffle to their nearest polling station, the task now lies solely on their judgment in deciding whether Italy supports, truly supports the current government. The rum roll, please. <clears throat> and the Italo-French detente. Ambassador Dom Domizio beamed for the flashing camera, standing beside key representatives for the French government for the past few weeks flashed by in a matter of clicks and smiles of the journalists who had come to document the detente. But now Bordeaux was all too familiar to him, and the trials of its people were forever ingrained into his own memory, all of it. The grueling hunger, the columns of refugees, the determination up bent unbent pride the French people had borne with it all. The French government was another matter. While political friction and long-winded arguments no doubt interspersed with almost all the meetings in the Hotel de Villa, compromise and camaraderie would carry the day or would not have been standing arm in arm as they were now. Disagreements were ironed out, and common ground found in enough matters to secure a positive outcome to the negotiations. One day, one they now hold up proudly, the Bordeaux Accords. <clears throat> De Goring's military cl uh, clique in Germany the news would no doubt be received with spite. Europe was at last determined to close ranks and face the renewed aggression by the Reich. The disunity and disbelief of 1940 would not assist the Hun this time. And should a unified front not suffice to dissuade the Fuhrer? Well, Italy's gained an invaluable and resilient ally in Bordeaux nonetheless. Should the worst come to be, Rome and Bordeaux would march arm in arm to confront it. This bundle of sticks, they will not break. And we re will review the fishing rights in the Mediterranean. Put simply, the French and Italian fishing borders are a mess, a, patchwork, a grand patchwork of ancient overlapping maritime borders. These borders have remained unresolved for over a decade since the Pact and the Triumvirate split. Tensions between the rival fishing ministries were a common occurrence, but since the relations were essentially frozen by the Pact's influence, nothing could be done about them. Now that France is no longer a German influence, we can finally resolve this issue. We will sit down with our French colleagues to finally work out a fair standardized system of fishing rights. It's time to bring it into the age of stare-downs and the odd brawl between our nation's fishing crews and instead introduce them to a new era of cooperation. Strikes spread across the country. In the days following the proclamation of the strike of fiat, many began to realize that Turin was merely the first spark in the tinderbox. Soon, similar strikes were announced in the other major industrial centers of the northern Italy, Milan. The working class district of Biocca, in the northeast of the city, home to numerous important factories such as Pirelli, became the location of numerous strikes and worker protests. The strikes were so prominent and widespread that even the most reluctant trade union, CISL, were tentatively forced to support them for fear of backlash. And the Central Committee of the UIL and the CGIL have released a statement giving full support to the strikes. The emergency isn't limited to Milan either. Genoa, Florence, Rome, Taranto, every other industrial city in Italy, even smaller towns, are beginning to flare up with strikes. Every working class sector is involved, from steel mill workers to railway workers and even other categories such as school teachers and nurses are beginning to set up strikes of their own as the snowballs are rapidly picking up speed and size. Their demands are as varied as many other groups have come from, ranging from the more stable contracts to better wages and reduced out working hours. While the police deployed at most locations where the strikes are taking place, the government is confident that no direct intervention is necessary, and with the trade unions now regaining control of the situation, it's only a matter of time before negotiations between 
begin between the unions and employers. While they will, of course, be forced to make concessions, a deal will surely be found in the end. While, in, while many in government are worried about communist or extremist infiltration, a direct intervention from the government could easily do more harm than good. This is a sign of a healthy economy. <clears throat> Let them try to find a balancing point, and hopefully this all... We'll say blows over, but we can find a resolution. Victory! Okay, but victory for the DC! Okay, wow! I thought we were going to have, like, at least some sort of mechanic where we can do something, but okay. The second ever Italian election after the end of fascism in Italy has yielded a decisive result. A decidedly centrist coalition of various Christian and liberal parties have secured a majority in Parliament. A formally dressed King Umberto II could be seen designating the small statute Amintor Fanfani as Prime Minister and instructing him to create a new cabinet. The new PM, who had previously overtaken Aldo Moro as a leading figure at DC, has shifted the party somewhat leftwards, promising cooperation and collaboration with the Front de, de Macatico on the pushing of their agenda. This significant move has angered many of the more conservative members of the coalition making up the new government. But the dominant position Fanfani holds in DC has allowed him to maintain his new direction that the party has chosen to go down. It now allows on the PM Fanfati and his government to guide Italy through the increasingly tenuous situation in the Middle East, along with accompanying domestic unrest from the rapidly worsening economic situation Italy finds itself in. Needless to say, the new government faces many problems as, as it enters Parliament, but that has not swayed Fanfanti's, or Fanfani's promises of success. One characterized by peace, liberty, and democracy. Viva la DC. Well, if I didn't knew, if I knew this was going to go... Oh, we changed our focus street. Oh, no. No, 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 I should not click on that. No, no, I knew this would happen. No, <laughs> I wanted a Bordeaux with us. Oh, no. But, man, that sucks that we didn't even get anything about that. Like, if I knew that, then we'd be even further left wing. I would. We might have just gone with more of the Catholic block, so. Uh, the strike escalates. It seems like the early hopes for peaceful resolutions of the strikes are being dashed one by one. The strikes around the country escalate into violence and demands. Workers control the factories and workplace democracy is only becoming... Are only similar demands and slogans that are starting to be chanted in Milan. Workers attempted to violently occupy the Pirelli factory were stopped by a police cordon, and in Turin, classes of the police began after workers started to accuse the police of being fascist dogs. The most worrying development of all, which has exacerbated the situation further, is that it seems like the communist agitators coming from universities and other youth movements are infiltrating and becoming influential among the striking workers. Communist red banners are being raised in marches and protests as students and workers march together. Universities are once again becoming inflamed with riots of their own, and frequent police sweeps barely begin to amend the problem, as all law enforcement forces are starting to be stretched thin in numerous cities. Communist groups are once again starting to occupy classrooms and even entire buildings of universities, and the reaction from fascist groups has infallibly caused numerous clashes among students, some of which result in serious injuries and deaths. Politics is, as always, divided and torn on how to deal with the issue. Representatives from D.C. and have argued that the government should act as a mediator between the employers and trade unions to quickly resolve tensions, while the F.D. has proposed enforcing the demands of the trade unions to safeguard the Italian worker. Finally, the, the B.N. has warned about the ever-present communist menace and demanded a hardline stance against the Red Snakes that crawl in the underbelly of the Italian cities. With well, the government so bitterly divided, well, we just had an election. The situation seems more unstable than ever, and with no hope of a quick and peaceful resolution in sight, the Italian companies are ready to suffer too. This is terrible news. Well, man, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, I guess it's the race one. I guess. I mean, I guess some people pulling strings in the back that we don't really know about, but okay. In the midst of chaos and ever-increasing difficulty, the voice of moderation and senses triumph over the dangerous upstarts who threaten the delicate balance of Italian democracy. PM Amator Fanfani is barely managing to secure leadership within his own party. As security to victory in the elections, now DC stands to shape Italian politics as a new decade begins. Many things must be done in order to weather the difficult situation Italy finds herself in after the Piazza Fonta, and the first priority is gaining total control over the parliament. Wait, Piazza Fonta? We didn't have it. What? We didn't have that event. Juan tries to occupy the state lane. Uh, let's double check here. So we probably don't have anything. Empire management. No, we have seven expendable points that we can't expend. Um, I'm not seeing anything else here. So uh, the situation in Milan, already plagued by strikes and riots, has further deteriorated. Following a major clash between right-wing and left-wing students, the Fronte Universitario de Azonia Nacional, Italy's right, major right-wing student organization, has attempted to occupy a few classrooms in Milan's university, the Statale. Barricading themselves in, the students of Fuan have employed their advantageous position to repel the assaults of their left-wing counterparts, who attempted to dislodge them. In response, various left-wing student groups have declared occupations of their own, and the Statale has been turned into a war zone. Good. Clashes have been violent and relentless, both bottles and rocks being flung by both sides in bloody confrontations with happening with crowbars and wrenches being used as weapons. The university's sector, or rector, has attempted to negotiate with the students to attempt to calm things down, but appears that, like his efforts, are going to be fruitless. The police have already cordoned, cordoned the university, and intervention might be only hours away. No comment has arrived from the leaders of FUAM, and the representatives of the BN and the coalition FUAN is associated with. This leads many to believe that the situation has deteriorated because of radicals within the organization acting independently from their superiors. The chaos of the stat statale is only yet another step of Milan's descent into chaos, and many worry that anarchy will soon spread to other universities of Italy, as did it 
as did it did last spring. This is madness, absolute madness. Okay, well, things are going to go crazy, but okay, you know, things happen. That is why it's always good to keep in the back of your mind. Well, actually, the growth didn't go down at all. No matter what happens in the future, you must prepare yourself and be able to re-educate yourself to maybe find new work because you never know how long your current position may be in. That's good. It's good advice for the future for anyone. Oh, please close out the state, state hall. Following recent events, the rector of the state hall has issued a formal plea for the help in Polizia de Stato and uh, the authorities, asking them to restore order in the university. With any semblance of negotiations breaking down, the police charge in the university, flushing out the students from the university and surrounding using copious amounts of tear gas, batons, and water cannons. Both FUAN and left-wing students have been targeted by police, leading to some condemnation coming from many political representatives regarding the perceived brutality. Numerous students have been greatly wounded following the police action, with dozens of them taken into custody by police. Numerous dangerous weapons, including makeshift bombs and a few guns, have been seized, but this new crackdown has done little to diffuse tension. Both sides, leftists and neo-fascists, accuse the other of collaborating with the police, and the political debate is only getting more heated, as leftist politicians accuse the BN of harboring neo-fascism and radicalism in FUAM, while BN politicians accuse the FD to allow communist infiltration in student groups close to their coalition. <clears throat> While the university, while the university has been pacified for now, the streets of Milan remain chaotic. Numerous students from leftist groups have now left the universities and are actively agitating the striking workers, spreading communist propaganda and calling for unity between workers and students to change the system. Meanwhile, the city's right wing has not sat idle. Local sections of the BN have expressed their condemnation of communist violence in the city and have announced that they won't be standing idly by while the Reds attempt to overtake Milan while the, while the police and politicians complacency. What can we do? How about we talk with them and find a middle ground? Because <clears throat> no one likes to see unemployed workers, but sometimes, I guess you could say capitalism must continue her march forward. But let's go ahead and do this one. Why not? The hot autumn. Autumn has begun. It's not an ordinary season. Everywhere in the country, it feels like a subterranean fire is rising. It's excruciating heat boiling the atmosphere from the very depths of the earth. An entire town in Campi has revolted over a factory being closed. Padova's university has become the theater of occupations and clashes. Numerous left-wing associations and local party HQs in Milan have been firebombed. Fascist students have been attacked and given a bloody beating by communist ambushes, and the strikes all over the country are only getting bigger. The hot autumn is upon us, a grand opera of tragedy and conflict. Many are those with stakes in the struggle, and many are being swept in this hot, searing wind that is blowing over Italy. A worker striking for a fair job that will let him care for his family in peace. A representative of Catholic trade union, who sees the world around him slowly consumed by flames. A young, idealistic neo-fascist, who, with his fellow students, hopes to bring Italy back on the right track. And a police officer, standing on the thin line between anarchy and repression. All their stories intertwine, meeting and abandoning each other, as the threads of humans do. Uh, but each and every one of us can only follow one thread in our mortal lives, and so a choice must be made between one of these four cross destinies. Whoa, we could have placed workers, union man, student, or policeman? Holy cow. But we'll think about that after we do clean up the Domus Maria. Maria. Despite not being a coalition like the FDRBN, the DC is far from being unified, despite the facade of unity that's shown off every year at the party, Congress, and Domus Marie. Several currents, cliques, and wings dominate its inner workings, and the party itself keeps together as a result of delicate balance between all these different components. In order to truly dominate Italian politics, Fanfani must dom first dominate DC, and the Prime Minister has due ideas on how to do that. The first would be concentrating on internal support from within the party, gathering support from other cliques, the others would be seeking help from other moderate politicians in order to solidify government stability. Now, we can say the student, but which student? Like, there's probably left-wing students and right-wing students. We have the workers. We have the union man, though, which is kind of a little bit different. And as a policeman, which you could maybe be part of a union as well. So, well, we shall see in just a little bit. So now we must make the choice. I think that for us, hmm, I'm kind of pulling towards the student. We could do the worker, but uh, I guess for this campaign, let's do the student because... Some of you guys might be students still, and that might be good, even though a worker or a union man probably could also be you guys as well. So let's just go with the student because we've all been students at one point. The Shadow of the Sun. According to the press and TV, the person guilty of the Plaza Fontana bombing has already been found. Pietro Valpreda, a known anarchist, was spotted entering the Banca Nacionale del Agricultura building with a large suitcase sometime before the explosion. If one were to, watch, were to watch any Italian news broadcast, it would seem like this was an open and shut case. Valpreda was a, had a flimsy alibi, a clear motive, and a connection to the war, or not war crime scene, but just crime scene. While many voices of varying levels of influence have criticized the narrative, pointing out its inconsistencies, most of the public, the journalists, and the politicians all feel reassured to know that the horror can be easily explained away by pointing a finger at a radical gang of anarchist fanatics, something which 
Amintor Fanfani is very happy to do, especially during his numerous appearances on national TV. The reports appearing on the desk of Prime Minister Fanfani tell a different story. After looking at some particular elements of the case, namely the bags used to carry the explosives and the terms which set them off, police and Carabinieri report point out to the possibility that the terrorist act was, in fact, not orchestrated by Milanese anarchists. Some photographs, documents, and recordings lend credibility to the fact that anarchist cells dormant in Milan for a long time have been infiltrated by extremist right-wing and neo-fascist groups, with a sort of mesh of personal relationships and political context between these anarchist groups and several fascist militants being documented. A hypothesis even emerged that the attack was in fact not carried out by Valpreda, but by another person connected to underground fascist groups carefully disguised look like Valpreda. However, this is not all. Although Moro, Aldo Moro and his extensive context in SIM, some through him, some top secret documents have reached Fanfani regarding the high possibility of foreign interference in the bombing. Some of the anarchist and fascist militias who were about to be further investigated by the po local police seem to have vanished into thin air. Some reference to what appears to be codenamed for what might very be well might very well be foreign operatives popping up in the material that the police amassed. All the officers involved in gathering and analyzing these elements have seemed to have forbidden themselves from formulating theories regarding where this foreign influence could have come from, almost as if they were in fear of possible implications. A black hand creeps in Italy changes the national focus tree. Well, can we let's get through this one focus first before we do that? We should have enough time to do so. So, we got oh, 12 days, 11 days. Oh, that, that'd be kind of tight. We might be able to get that done, maybe. Born 99% of the way there. That's nice. A day at the university. Uh, Virgilio Inselli awoke, looking out to the window of his dorm, groaned and felt angry. It's an unseasonably warm it was unseasonably warm for this, this late in the year, and the poorly ventilated dorm was baking. Of course, it wouldn't matter if there was any money in the school budget for some half decent AC, but there wasn't. The school properly had wasted all the money in keeping the union workers happy, and the economy had been in the trash since the democratic transition anyways. He got dressed and walked to his first class, History of Italian Politics. The professor was a degenerate coward, probably a secret communist, and worst of all, a woman. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I just realized what the name was, and Celia thought about her, and he felt hateful. <laughs> On his way, a group of radical students was holding a demonstration in the main university thoroughfare. Their proud red banners caught the sunlight as they strutted back and forth, and they had a partisan sort of bravery about them. As they chanted slogans, if Virgilio had been with his friends, the brave companions of the Fronte Universitario de Acción Nacional, they would have been chased and left us back to their hidey holes. But they were busy, and he was alone, so he slunk away and proceeded. It wasn't that Virgilio and Sally was reluctant to join in the struggle for national redemption. It's just that he was indecisive. Many of his fellows were meeting with national organization, trying to persuade the BN to find his balls. They had asked him to come, and he had demurred. They had high hopes for Almiranta. He had been a rising star in the PNF before his disillusion, but now he seemed nothing more than a tired old man. Others were at the new front, fighting the new battle with sticks and rocks against communists and other police collaborators. As uh, the dude, the student, joined the class, his thoughts were still on the strikes, meetings, and the future of the nation, but they strayed from his from this as well, and moved on to other things, feelings he had half forgotten, a home, a father who didn't understand, having comrades but not friends, and as the class came to its end, and, uh, and Sally stood at the building's threshold, struggling to make a decision, he felt lonely, so much to do, so little time, you know, I didn't know we would go with that, that, that route for the student, wow, <laughs> okay, an early night, home for Inselli was quite... Uh, oh, holy crap, it was quite a middle-class district on Milan's outskirts. It wasn't a long trip, but he took his time nonetheless. Virgilio had been surprised at how easily his compatriots in the FUAN had accepted his departure. He expected that they would plead for him to stay to accompany the leadership to Rome in the BN meeting or to barricade to strike down the Bolshevik protesters, but they had accepted his flimsy excuses with a small wave. Perhaps they had never put much faith in his leadership as he had thought. He showed them. He showed everyone. His father would be the first. He'd seen the error of his ways, and by tomorrow he'd be at, with them at the barricades. DC, CISL, and all the spineless traitors, well, he would, they would be neutered, and then Sally would get his credit for destroying one of the three loathsome oppressors of the Italian people. <clears throat> Virgilio thought back to their last conversation when he told his father he'd join the FUAM. Expected him to be proud, hadn't he always said that socialism would be the first thing to destroy Italy? Hadn't he, like any good citizen, had a poster of El Duce on their dining room wall? But father first, Inselli had changed. He had been infected by the same weakness that permeated the rest of the nation. So father and son had parted in rage and tears, one to join the most effeminate and corrupt of unions, the other to join the bold youth restoring the nation to greatness. It didn't matter, and Sully would show him. This time, with the streets filled with fire and radicals, he had had no choice but to see the light. The train pulled into the station, and Virgilio stepped off, shivering slightly, undoubtedly from the excitement of teaching his father the truth of national revolution, or perhaps the cold, no place like home. Let's see, it was a long bus ride to Rome, and a longer wait as a BN security 
checked and double checked uh, Virgilio's clearance. When at last he was reunited with his comrades in FUAM, it was a new while after noon and uh, Virgilio was thoroughly agitated. This time, it must be noted, not entirely to his detriment, that the FUAM was a sort of organization where the furious agitation paid silver. Gold of it was particularly insipid furious agitation rooted in the general angst of everyday life and directed at the enemies, whoever that might be at the, any particular time. FUAM or at least the significant portion of its central committee. Present that meeting was a place of speeches, a place of rage and rabble-rousing, a place of daring political maneuvers against the vile enemies of the Italian nation. These usually ranged from traitors and cowards in Rome, vilified from a safe distance in the organization's weekly newsletter, to the on-campus radicals and leftists, enemies of all decent people, and positively destroyed and eviscerated regularly by the scathing cartoons drawn by second years Mario Salvini, often accompanied by Inselli's scathing editorials. But the FUAM was more than just a group of noisy kids. They were the forefront of the National Revolution. They were the Italian future. Their action was more than just pranks and name-calling. They were bold moves to defend the people. And they were more than just pranks and name-calling. More often than not, when strike escalated into violence, it was FUAM on the front lines. When heads needed to be kicked in, FUAM was a steel boot, st steel toe boot that did the job. There were whispers that some other radical members had bought arms illegally and were willing to use them, but the actions of these new daredevils were spoken in on, of in hushed tones, but odd ones nonetheless. Virgilio and Silly, that such a committee will now see you. Uh, let's see, a scorching, scorching morning. Or maybe a scorching morning. Of all things, Virgilio hated being late for anything near to that top of the list. He hated how it reflected poorly on himself and invited judgment, even when it wasn't his fault in any way. Like his, like this morning, when his usual route to the HQ was disrupted by the prancing and shrill shrouding shrill shouting of protesters. Being late also meant that he had to endure the slight of the meeting already having begun by the time he arrived. He had to pretend like nothing was wrong when his arrival prompted everyone else to turn and greet him, interrupting their discussion with empty pleasantries and mocking smiles all the way until Virgilio took a seat. Considering the circumstances, he was none too pleased when he realized that they were planning demonstrations of their own. Is this what we're reduced to? Pickets and slogans? It was telling just how eager his comrades were to justify their decision. Don't think of it like that. Think of it like this instead. Another cut in as if they rehearsed the gosh darn thing. We can only benefit by playing alongside with the Democrats for the, being, for the time being. We have, as it stands, something of a public image issue. And we show ourselves to be reasonable and willing to work with the system that we have now. We can start to repair that image. Another piped up. How can the media slander us and call us thugs and brutes if we're out there with signs and protesting peacefully like the rest after all? Because they will regardless. Virgilio's arms were crossed over his chest and he slouched some in his chair as he made the case. The, their case. He didn't like it any more than he did at the start, but he had to admit that the plan had some merit. Not a great deal, but some. I'll bow to your collective wisdom, so what's the plan then? The speaker practically beamed as he was allowed to continue. I was just saying that I've spoken to the police. They'll form a perimeter to the police. Virgilio's voice betrayed more of his incredulity than he meant to. Yes, the police, as we said, we're trying to appear legitimate and law-abiding. They can both protect us if the communists try to antagonize us. They'll be willing to fight us alone, but with right cops with shields and batons, that would they, they wouldn't have the balls. He went back to the detail and the intricate details of the little protest, and Virgilio was left sinking further into his chair. A tamer approach than usual. And probably something else? No? Yes? Maybe? Budget stuff? representatives from the party. In the city of Rome, birthplace of European civilization, there was a building. A building was owned by the BN, a party that stood for the defense of Italian civilization, nationalism, and democracy hand in hand, definitely not fascism. It was not a grand building. All on the outside, it wasn't nearly as impressive as a concrete behemoth that served as the party's HQ near the city centers. This building was made out of cracked brick and <clears throat> graffitied heavily by all the ver varieties of descent ne'er-do-wells. The inside similarly lacked the many creature comforts of the BN headquarters, being notably devoid of the in-house bars and the smoke rooms that the BN's main locus Spartan exterior hid so well. Still, it was a building that the party put to good use. There were leaflets, not ready yet for release, that needed storage, certain items devoted to party loyalists which were inappropriate to store in a public place, and meetings that might be best kept out of view of the commons. It was for this purpose that the building was used one fall, warm fall day, as representatives from the BN Central Committee met with the Grand Council of the Front of National Action for University Students. The room was uncomfortably warm, with a great reluctance the students students removed their black jackets. A few of them had soon in small face fasces or depictions of Mussolini on its breast pockets, and they grew glum as they discarded the wonderful attempt to challenge the BN's transition to non-fascism. The BN representatives were, for the most part, exactly as Virgilio and Sally had expected. A group of old men in suits who harumphed at the most mild suggestions of direct action and wrung their hands in response to FUAN's zeal. The meeting also went about as well as he could thought, thought it would. The FUAN proposed a direct series of counter-demonstrations against the counter-demonstrations, and the BN looked shiftily from side to side. The FUAN demanded permission to openly use words communists, Bolshevik tra traitors, and bourgeois, uh, and referring to their mutual enemies. The BN fiddled with their ties, the FUAN wanted the BN to formally support their right to use violence and self-defense, and the BN declared that it was time for a lunch break. When they returned, Inselli decided he had enough of this. It was time to bring matters to a head and find out where the party's true allegiance lay. He cleared his throat and began to speak, you are either with us or 
and our quest for the national revolution against us. You're with us in our fight against Bolshevism. Against us. Um, it seems like no matter what, this seems like the same thing. Against Bolshevism for the national revolution. Uh, I'm going to go with this one. Attention. Oh, my goodness. Holy cow. The field of battle is ready. The forces stood ready with their banners and flags, their helmets and weapons, their ranks and files. The only thing that was missing was a war and an enemy to fight. It would be only a slight exaggeration to say that the FUA and students were as heavily armed as the protectors that day. Uh, batons rested lazy in their hands as their helmeted heads looked up towards the speaker the second of the evening in a matter that reminded one more of the soldiers uh, standing at attention than students listening to a speaker at a political rally. The speaker moved and spoke with the kind of energy that bombast that seemed familiar to many, including most of the police who, uh, who served as the rally's protective cordon. As he continued, Inspector Ovidio turned towards Inspector Constantini and whispered with all the subtlety of a tank. Where the kids find this one anyway, to remark, narrowing his eyes skeptical towards the stage. He's good. It looks professional, too. I had kind of assumed that one of them would be up there, not someone who looked like he could sit in Parliament. Constantini tilted his head and tapped his own chin slightly with his own baton. I've seen him before, I think. He muttered idly. He does a lot of these speeches. I've walked by him once before on my way home. They were joined by an unexpected third voice, one of that of FUAN student leaders, Virgilio and Selly, who moved away, who moved his way towards the rear and apparently overheard them. That's Pino Romualdi. He's from PN, BN, trying to show a little respect. Ovidio shrugged nonchalantly, seeming, seeming to not even notice the student's aggressive body language or tone. He's just a speaker trying too hard to look and sound like an old duce, too. Someone should tell him that he has a microphone and doesn't need to yell so loudly. Well, maybe it's he inherited. Came in Sully's southern retort. It was about as eager to explain as they were to ask, which wasn't at all, so he pivoted in quickly. Besides, maybe you two listened to his words and said, Bombs, you'd learn a thing or two about strength. Constantini felt an eye twitch involuntarily. Maybe he should use some of that strength to tell us before he shows up unannounced next time. The speeches were supposed to be over by now. A fun instant sense of regret for having said that, but that was nothing compared to the look of the abject hatred the young Inselli offered him instead. Uh, brush it off. Just brush it off. Uh, breaking the silence, a key turned into the lock. The door opened. A feet stepped over a balcony that hadn't crossed in years, and the father and son stood face to face. They were a strange pair, one of them dressed in a suit and tie of any respectable professional union operative. Complete with graying hair and tired eyes, the other sporting a leather jacket, a shaved head, and a fast used pin. For a moment, there was silence. Father was the first to break it. Are you all right? I heard what happened in the statale. Of course. He had seen what had happened on TV and wanted to make sure that if his precious little boy was okay. I'm fine. The silence returned, colder and emptier than before. This time, Virgilio spoke. I came to see if you changed your mind. About you joining that group of Nazi performance artists? Of course I haven't. The words came out faster and harsher than Father first had intended, but when he spoke, again, there was a quiver in his voice. But you're still my son. The silence was deeper than ever, and the abyss between father and son, like a thousand boxes, emptiness, and a forgotten warehouse. Then Virgilio spoke once more. Perhaps I was wrong. I'm not wrong. He is. Uh, this seems a little. This seems a little rushed. I'll be honest. Like it doesn't seem like a. You know. It seems somewhat natural, but not fully natural. But at this point, it seems like this Virgilio guy would probably say, "No, I'm not wrong. He is." <sighs> I'm gonna go with that one because it just. It feels like it's more of the character for he is. But hey, this got our GDP to over 100, 100 billion. That's nice. All right, we'll select the thing. And let's give it a, maybe another day to see what happens. The party's uncertainty. Oh, oh, Fonfani's here. He's, he's smiling. If you like to read about him, go right ahead. He is a dude. Oh, my good. Oh, oh. What the? Oh my gosh, there's so much reading. Silence. Before turning away and rejoining the rest of the students to watch out the remainder of the Ro Romualdi speech, eventually the man's speech would run its course, and while he offered one final call to action to a steadfast audience, there was a sense of palpable relief that washed over both student and officer. Quickly, with perhaps a little bit more haste than one considered polite, the police went into formation to provide the escort for the FUA and students to leave the square. Curiously, however, the students didn't take their time getting ready. They didn't seem to really be moving or preparing much at all. The gathered audience, it was Ro Ro Romualdi, and the other speakers prepared to go on their way, just stayed and milled about listle listlessly in the square. Inspector Constantini appeared at the sun that threatened to set behind the horizon and then back to the formed line of officers. Letting his shoulders sink, he nodded to himself before walking up and towards the, the gathered students. He reached out to tap the shoulders of the nearest one and once again was met with scornful gaze of Virgilio. Mr. Inselli, Constantini maintained an even diplomatic tone to his voice, though he suspected his face betrayed in how tired he was at this point. The cordon is ready to escort you and your compatriots out of the square. We were wondering when. That won't be necessary, came the curt reply of Virgilio, cutting off the officer and leaving both silent. As the inspector process processed what had just happened, Virgilio gave a brief glance back to his fellow students who didn't know what game Virgilio was playing. Not that he could blame them. He didn't know even know what he was trying to accomplish save for stepping on the pig's toes. Not necessary. Constantini tilted his head towards the youth, a way out if he wanted to take it, but the offer only emboldened the young and Sally. Entirely unnecessary. We're not leaving. Our point has not been, not been yet made. 
He crosses his arms and maintain eye contact with Constantini. Feel free to go home yourselves, however. We can handle ourselves without you. With a deep shy and shrug, Inspector Constantini turned back towards the cordon. It was going to require a few more opinions on this firm resolve or a sense of stubbornness. They're not on our side. You are either with us or and our quest for the national revolution or against us. The words that seem powerful and daring in Sally's head, but out loud they seem only pithy. Even his compatriots on FUA on side of the table seem embarrassed. As the silence following Virgilio's pronouncement grew, they glared at his hands, feet anywhere but his eyes wide and scared, or the red pouting in his face. Then the uncomfortable sounds was broken by applause. From the far end of the BN side of the table, there was one man who, had, who, had, who, while equal to the others in aging demeanor, differed from them radically in appearance. He wore a tight black turtleneck, somehow more imposing than a student's black leather. On his lapel, he wore not just a fasces, but also the knife and skull. It was he who applauded, his hands meeting in sarcastic enthusiasm, the cruel lines of his face wrinkled in enthusiasm. When he spoke, the other BN reacted with curious mixtures of exasperation. Absolutely. These youngsters might need some guidance, but they've got the right idea. The nation's gone to heck, and we need other vigor to bring it back. Believe, obey, and fight. That's what we need. We need to meet violence with violence. The stunned silence returned, but before the students could react, one of the suits spoke in a crisp uh, tone of crisp denial. Or dismissal, really. The meeting is done. We appreciate the work of the FUM, but we must ask you to vacate party premises immediately. Moments later, Virgilio and the others were outside the building, a few of their jackets left behind in the haste of the failure. The morning heat had evaporated, and the fat morning droplets had begun to fall from the sky, and Sully supposed that he should feel angry that he should that he rally his compatriots against a weak and traitorous BN and their hollow bourgeois democracy they supported. But they only felt sadness of failure, and the only disappointment in their eyes, well, back to university. And we shall go with... Uh, actually, let's do the party of universities next. The PM sat in the hotel ballroom, surrounded by his usual entourage of aides, secretaries, and supporters. The many wings of the party looked back at him, their faces calm, but their eyes betraying the uncertain hope that they held in him to guide Italy through turbulent times. The political left could, o could offer the words of support where they agreed, and plenty of condemnation where they didn't. The political right sent him the nice letters when they could be stirred to bother sending them. Such was the price of attempting to chart a center course. It had taken nearly five minutes to calm the assembled delegates before he was finally allowed to speak. He prepared a speech lay written in cards in his suit pocket. But with the worried glances being shot into him from all sides of the room, it was quite obvious that taking it out would only further fracture the party. With a forced smile and a wiping of his brow, he attempted to speak on how the party could bridge the growing divide between within Italy and indeed within itself. Compromises began, compromises led to the end of fascism, to the end of political tyranny and uncertainty within Italy. The voters selected me for this office not because of radical ideas and bomb throwing populism, but because all Italians know when, that whether they agreed with us or not, that DC offered practical functioning solutions. He wiped his brow again and gave another forced smile. Some of the cuts even Return it. For the next 30 minutes, he continued to offer his hopes for the future of Italy and its democracy, his hopes for the party unity and confidence, and his hopes for an end to uncertainty and panic. Perhaps the delegates could not truly believe him, but as long as they could say that they did, it was a good enough. Fine, finally, shall lead us through these troubled times. And this was also called Against the Coming of Night. Virgilio's lower lip trembled as the words hung in the air, but he spoke softly, almost as if recalling from his own message, I don't know if I deserve it. He admitted quietly with a choked voice and downcast eyes. Neither party was quite sure when they transitioned into an embrace or who stepped into the first the other first, but with a face buried in his father's shoulder, Virgilio let out a scream muffled by the suit and shoulder. It was a scream of years lost, a scream that expelled and breathed out his hatred. He held deep inside a scream that banished the rage and violence that it allowed to permeate to his core. His father hugged him all the tighter in response, and after a few seconds that lasted an eternity, he slowly led Virgilio into his home, their home. After leaving the pale-faced, tear-eyed youth on a chair, his father prepared a, a, a kettle of tea for the two of them, and they continued to speak. I don't know where to come where to continue from here, Virgilio admitted, staring at the steam rising from his cup. I feel as though I unleashed him as a monster, and now all I can do is watch it destroy that uh, which I try to save. His father sat and nodded as his son spoke. As always, your trail is your own ablaze, but if you want my advice, he began breathing in deep as he sat aside an empty cup. Follow some of your own. I don't understand. Before you left, back before you left, he interrupted, leaning over the table empathetically. Back before you well and truly lost your way, we often argued, and you told me that when the evil rose, it was a duty of good men to stand against it, that anything else only abetted such evils. Yes, he leaned back. If you unleash this beast of hatred, of rage and violence, then if you are going to start becoming a good man, it is up to you to stand against it. I don't think I can. The barricade is still up, and there are many more of them that there are of me. Virgilio rubbed an arm uncertainly as he spoke in spite of their heat. Words, Virgilio, are action. His father declared empathetically, violence does not cure violence, so perhaps it's time for you to give the strength of words instead of fists. Uh, Virgilio mulled that over in his head a few times after hearing that, and his brows knit in determination as the vision grew clearer. He knew what he had to do. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. Violence does not cure violence? Well, I'm not sure if I yeah, necessarily agree, because sometimes wars have to be met with violence. But hey, whatever. The complications in the East. This may be the start of the great crisis to rock our nation yet. Yeah, contain the fire. Um, well, we could do this stuff, the moderate stance, stronghold, hold, hog the spotlight, and this stuff, um, support Sarah Gats. 
the king's blessing, everything's under control, or taking over Moro's clique, control the Doro Tai, enlightened centrism. You know what? I'll leave that up to you guys, just because I, it doesn't really matter to me too much. Do we should go down the moderate stronghold or convergence parallel? Hog the spotlight, uh, condemn the riots, of course. Promise peace. The white whale ascendant. Huh. Oh, and then we ought to complete that then. Revamp the export infrastructure. Devalue the lira. Oh boy. So let me know which way we should go. Let's go to Hog the Spotlight and condemn the riots. Maybe that's a good thing to do. In these difficult times, people feel scared, angry, frustrated. The economy suffers and political violence is reaching unbearable levels. What the people need is reassurance, a friendly face promising them that everything will be alright and that Italy is on the track to prosperity. That face has to belong to Fanfani. Whether they turn on the TV or open a newspaper, Italians will find the calming smile of the Prime Minister. Whenever they listen to the radio, they will hear his reassuring voice. Fanfani and the DC must dominate the media and do so. And to do so, we must ensure that our control of the RAI and other media outlets allows us to truly let our message reach the people. So has anything really happened else? Like, we're still trying to do our normal stuff. Oh, counter-terror it is. The recent attack on the Piazza Fontana has shaken the nation to its core, spreading fear among the population. Many have begun to think that the bombing of Milan was only the beginning of something far greater. Enemies of Italian democracy may hide everywhere in our armed forces, in our secret service, and our media, and even our own very government. Terrorists and their hidden supports plot in the shadow. And our only hope of letting Italian democracy survive is to bring the schemes to light. Our current estimates on terror control in the country as follows. 18, 14, 50%, 20%. People said in the government. Um, I'll, I'll be honest here. Like, we didn't have, we didn't have the P Piazza Fonta event. Like, it didn't pop up. Like, that's a super event that we should get. But I, I don't know, like, why they keep bringing it up when it didn't happen. But okay, they're students, practically children. If they don't want to move, then they, they make the move. Your police act like it. That response wasn't what Constantini had had wanted to hear from the HQ. He had hoped that the chief might be willing to negotiate with them, but the terms were clear. This disorderly behavior went on from beyond the protections of the right to gather together and right to protest, and they would just have to obey. Well, they came prepared. If we're going to force them to go anywhere, they're going to need some backup. The FUA, on, on the other hand, was not of, of a mind to negotiate, nor were they of a mind to obey. It had taken a bit of time and more than a bit of reinforcing fiery rhetoric to sway the other members of the FUA and over to his side, but in spite of their general spotlessness, Virgilio and Sally would gain ground. It's about time we practice a little of what we preached. It's time we showed these corrupt officials what Italian strength and spirit looks like in action. Came his final rallying cry, met with the scattered shots and hoots from the rest of the student body. He was turned, and with the helmets and flags of the FUA on standing behind him, he faced the baton wielding police officers. Any chance you'll overthink this insanity? Constantini offered land one last time, an empty hand extend, extended in a gesture of goodwill towards the man on the other side of the gap. If you go now, there won't be any consequences. It'll be as if we parted ways the way we were supposed to. Uh, this was meant only with a shake of the head from Virgilio. We will not back down. He opened his mouth to speak further, but was interrupted by the hum of engines and the sound of tires over the cobblestone as armored vehicles moved into Strong Square. The gathered students took a tentative half step back at the sound of the armored cars, but before Ancelli could reply to the display, it was interrupted again by the whirling of rotors. Constantine squinted up towards the heavens and murmured to himself with great incredulity in his voice, the machine gun might be overkill. This has certainly escalated. Knives in the back. And this is getting a bit crazy. Okay, a fate arrived for Ancelli in the form of a small manila envelope battered by its journey through the labyrinthian the Italian mail system. It was not the first to see such a missive, nor had he entirely given up hope that he would be spared. The first had been the crazies. The contrarian lunatics who cling to every patriotic organization like musils to a whale. The ones who spoke admirably of Faranacci, of Hitler, and even the discipline of Burgundy. A few of them had somehow wormed their way into the leadership of the FUAM, and when they received the letters, no one spoke out because, after all, they were lunatics. Then it was a spineless... Those who, fought ever, who sought ever greater power for themselves and were willing to ally with anyone and say anything to increase their own power. They would be in one meeting making bold claims of the violence uh, bold claims of the violence necessary for the restoration of Italian strength, and another wringing their hands about every scrape and bruise the FUA meted out to its Bolshevik rivals. When they received the letters of dismissal, no one spoke out because they were weak, and Sully had let, had, had let himself hope that, that the BNN, the BN, had some potential after all, that they were merely acting to refocus its sister student organization, and that any day now they apologized for the conduct of the meeting and invite the remaining leadership back for the further planning, but then it was honorable. The true scions of Italian nationalism, the ideological heirs of Mussolini, who sought to once more raise the people's patriotic consciousness and shepherd it in, in return to glory. When the letters came for them, there was no one left to speak out, no leadership council to speak ex of except for the PN's puppets and toadies. Virgilio read the words one more time, his vision blurred with tears of rage, when all the leadership of the BN appreciates your contribution to the national student movement. We have decided it is for the benefit of the movement for you to vacate your leadership position immediately. He threw the letter aside. He would fight them. He would go around the city, find all the representatives of past and present, and rally them to action. FUAN's ex-leadership was rapidly accumulating in alphabet soup of splinter groups, and so they would be their unifier. They'd go to the BN's offices and make them see the way. They would fail, they'd be arrested, there was nothing he could do, the National Students' Movement was defeated. He could do nothing, he had failed, always backroom schemes. 
a whimpering flame, and for the first time in recent memory. <clears throat> Virgilio saw the world with clear eyes, and when he saw the world around with barricades, he saw madness. Slogans, chants were being thrown across the socialist protesters in the fascist barricade. Threats of violence and denunciations filled the air, and what was not sweet to the air had a harshness to it that he couldn't detect before. A deep breath in through his nose and out through his mouth, Virgilio stood himself as he snuck his way around the protesters to return to the barricade, where he was greeted with the shots of approval and ecstatic greetings from his comrades. Virgilio, what took you so long? We had thought you might have fled. Glad to see we were wrong. The Reds are growing agitated out there. Have you heard anything that can help us? What is the nation saying about this? Are they rallying behind our example? Virgilio tugged at his heart, shirt collar for a moment, and spoke slowly and with a measured tempo. The nation remains as divided as ever, he admitted, glancing as, at the faces of his compatriots. It's clearly not what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear of a fascist nation reinvigorated by the, their actions here. He had to lay it, lay it on thick. Some think that we're doing here is admirable, while others scold us for our defiance and belligerence. But surely we are doing good work here, right, Virgilio? The ones who stand with us aren't feeling idle, right? Virgilio's sound struck with them. Um, uh, more severely than any other words. Where once fiery and passionate eyes glared hatefully at the enemy across the way, they now glanced uncertainly between one another. They were looking for that fire, that fear that up to a few moments ago they shall all shared. There was none to be found. The fire dies. Maybe some more events? Maybe three in a single day? No? Okay. So, that that was a lot of reading. Like, in a single day, you get like three events popping up. Like, I don't mind events, because that's... I, I, I play TNO for events. Well, here we go again. Yep, another three. But, like, three in a day is kind of extreme. So, return to the nest. Milan is a city that has inspired many a poem and a song throughout the ages of its beauty and grandeur. But alas, the age of fascism has not been kind to the moral capital of Italy. As golden cathedrals had gone to rust, its quaint homes and outlying villages were replaced by endless blocks of unchanging apartments. It was to the city, static but surviving, that a train rolled into one Tuesday night. Its occupant filled, uh, filled out heads... Uh, hung low, exhausted from the trip and the failures they experienced in its duration. But despite their bad news and long faces, they were still greeted at the university with a hero's welcome. And Sully quickly found himself surrounded by the crowd of admirers and a bottle of wine pressed into his hands as it urged him to recount the details of his trip to Rome. And the haze of good drink and companionship, the details of the trip began to change his mind. The BN's attitude was not defeat, it was merely a setback. The FUAN was not broken, it was merely reorganizing to rise again. And so he listened to his friends and spoke to them in turn. They spoke of the grandeur that Italy lost, and would no doubt regain. All the undesirables that filled the streets like rats would be cleansed. The religions of Rome would march once more into the world to firmly discipline the traitors and barbarians that threatened its conquests. They were surrounded by his partners by his partners in heroic struggle, listening to a drunk first year rambling about a group of so called nuclear army or some such, and so he felt content. It ends well after all. Retreat. The field of battle was ready. This is very weird. The order of this is this these events are portrayed in is not very good. The field of battle was ready, though. The forces stood ready with their banners and flags, their helmets and weapons, their ranks and files. The only problem now was the helmet, flag, baton stood across from the armored cars, helicopter, and machine guns. Virgil, please, come, came the last plea from the Inspector Constanti. He had set down his own baton, th though the gesture was awfully futile, seeing his own words were backed by machine guns. Just stand down. Virgilio looked towards the inspector and then back over his shoulder. He looked towards the rest of the FUAN, the fear on their faces, as they watched the helicopter d hover in the air. The officers, the other officers, began to take cover behind the cars, discarding batons for firearms. Constantini looked over the back of his shoulder towards the questioning and uncertain faces of the security cordon. Would they have the bellies to fire on these students? Would the students actually be stupid enough to fight? He watched a man silently remove the magazine from his pistol, thinking that no one was watching, and he watched another consciously move to the side of Creedon Avenue. Tension filled the air, and all that was wait for a single twitch, an errant movement, a single spark to set out the entire scene, but what it got instead was a clatter of a stick against the cobbles at the feet of Virgilio and Sally. He had making a big show of casting down the weapon before turning back towards the compatriots, who at all once filled the square with the noise of dropping wood, and the furling up of flags and banners, some who stood without... Their weapons chose to cast down the helmets or throw off the gloves and armbands instead. I think he began, projecting his voice to the gathered students. We have made our point. The sun is setting. Let's go home before the keepers of the peace escalate the scene further. The venom in his voice could be felt throughout the square, even as the officers backed off and away. A new miss. Well, if the officers open fire on you, that would put, paint you in a very good light, because you are the victim. Now, I'm not saying they're right, but that would paint you as looking like a victim, which could be used for propaganda efforts. Just saying, the changing tides. The world seemed to be spinning around the gathered students, where once they could navigate the chaos and confusion of the times with the help of their firm faith in the fascist ideals of yore, the foundation of which their strength was built was at all once rocked. The uncertainty, the fear, the panic immediately set in. They looked to Virgilio for guidance, and he spoke with a resigned voice. There is nothing we, nothing here for us. When the sun sets, we can slip away. We can pretend like pretend like nothing happened, Virgilio. When did you turn so craven? A voice piped up from behind him. He didn't recognize the man, but evidently the man recognized him. I... Yes, I think it's pretty clear that... The man interrupted him, slipping between Virgilio and the other students. Pretty clear that your belly is weak and your spirit quails in the wake of the challenge. You want to know why no one has rallied? Because we're all done 
because all we've done is hide behind wood and stone. Once again, Virgilio could feel his blood rise and the bile build up in his throat. But it wasn't like that before. It was different on some level he couldn't quite identify. And what would you propose instead? The Royal Valka too uh, shot a fist up into the air. We'll take the fight to the communists. We rush to the Reds, prove our valor, and drive them off before us. Then all Italy will see that she has all her strength. It was strange. He said much the same before and often. Had he sounded so deluded before? How many people must have written him off as a madman? How many people might have been right to do so? Virgilio glanced over towards the rest of the students and sighed. This was a mistake. Call this. Those of you with something to live for, come with me. He turned and began to walk, and he could hear the meek shuffling of feet. About half of those gathered, he reckoned. And those of us with something to fight for will stay. Go home, you old women, to your knitting and rocking chairs. Rocking chairs are awesome. Us men will fight for you even still. The remaining half turned and went back to the palisade. When a hand is offered to save the falling band, someone would rather save their pride than their body. Okay. Cool. Cool. Nope, still not done yet. 30 days left. And are we pretty much done with this? Because I think we've tapped everything. Quiet. Oh my goodness, why is it three every single day? The moon, the mood in the FUIN headquarters was noticeably depressed when the rest of the leadership slinked in and found their chairs. Virgilio had been there for a short time, though he exaggerated his lounging position to make it look like he'd been there waiting for much longer. When he walked in, he slowly lowered his boots from the desk and leaned upright, hands folded over the table. To say that it did not go according to plan would be an understatement, Virgilio began, to the lukewarm mutterings of agreements from the rest of the attendants. Our image is going to take a while to recover, one of them replied. Another spoke as well. And there's no way the police are going to allow us any more public gatherings after that display. He shook his head, practically trembling in anger, and that media is already slandering us as if we've been the ones responsible for. What has happened has happened, Vir Virgilio sighed, placing his hands on the desk and raising, rising from his chair. We can't change it. Whether the demonstrations were a bad idea from the start or a good idea simply turned ill is entirely immaterial. What matters now, he pointed a finger to the desk to emphasize his speech, is where we are going from here. The gathering leaders fell silent as Virgilio did. They glanced between each other and eagerly searched the ceiling and floor for the ever-elusive answer to the question, the question they had eventually vocalized. So... Where do we go from here? Virgilio stood up and looked around at the sullen faces of his compatriots. The way I see it, there are only two directions we can go. Either we can keep going into this, doing this, participation thing that the Democrats want from us until we fade entirely into the margins of history books and so on, off the pages entirely. He paused for effect and allowed the chances of the darkness on their faces to lift, replaced by rage and frustration that twisted their visages. He held up a fist as he continued, or we can change our tactics. They want us, they want to use guns, we'll use guns. They want lead, we'll use all the streets with it. If Italy must bleed so she can live, so then so be it. But we don't allow our nation to perish under the faltering gaze of limp-wristed bureaucrats and vampiric politicians. All at once, depression gave way to anger, and anger gave way to resolve. As one, the leadership of the FUAM stood and gave a Roman salute for Virgilia for the front... Uh, Universitario de Azione Nacional for Italia. The battle may be lost, but the war is yet to come. And a shameful retreat. When it came to fight, the new black shirts of Italy fought with the conviction and with the courage and spirit of the old Rome in their hearts and their minds. A fire burned in their bellies and they craved for the fight and they wanted to fight. Even so, they lost the fight. It wasn't even particularly close either against the socialist overwhelming numbers and the police with their riot gear and batons. Spirit proved to be of little use as a weapon or armor. It was them, the true sons of Italy, the salvation of the nation and those who carried the spirit of Mussolini with them who skulked away or sulked away from the battle. For now, they had no choice but to hide their shame and the humiliation of their failure to hear them. But that was only for the time being. The fascists would hide their face, they'd sink off, but they'd go home. They'd reflect on their defeat here, and if their spirits didn't quell, it would be it would be a source of rage, of fury, fuel for the fire in the belly. They, they'd take that with them to the dorms, homes, villages, and communities. It would burn inside of them, and it would serve as a hundred beacons for those with a similar spirit. A rage, a familiar rage, as the bloody fascists. Let the Reds celebrate now. They can have their p repetitive songs and girlish dances. While they're patting themselves on the back, the black shirts will nurse their wounds and prepare for the next round. They will learn from the mistakes and be more, pre more prepared for whenever... My apologies for that. Someone just barged in my room, so I had to cut it off right there. So, uh, let the Reds celebrate for now. They can have their repetitive songs and girlish dances while they're patting themselves on the back. The Black Shirts will nurse their wounds and prepare for the next round. They will learn from mistakes and be more prepared for whenever the next competition occurs in whatever form it does. At least, that's the hope. Anyways, the battle's lost, but the war's only beginning, of course. And figli di una frontiera. Though it had continued for de jure for some time more, the FUAM was dead. Some of its members largely drifted into the BN's better organized and officially sponsored groups. Others dropped out of the campaign for a national revolution entirely, as if awakening from a bad dream. Some, however, took a different path. Italy's universities had always had their share of graffiti artists. One could find tags, hammers, and fasces, and sickles aplenty. But these days, hardly a stretch of wall or bathroom stall could be found that wasn't decorated with swastikas. In some places, it wasn't negligent art of malcontents, but intricate murals of bright futures and desolate wastelands alike, with the curious pagan symbol in place of the sun. The FUAM was dead, but the dream of its members and the romantic quest for an Italy that never was had been never been stronger. It was a dream that grew more radical and dangerous by the day as its members found ever more energetic channels with which to express their beliefs. If they could not have the Italy they wanted, the respected great power and prosperous fascist economy still described in too many textbooks, then they would have no Italy at all. From the ashes it would arise again better and stronger, a golden eagle unleashed upon the world, we shall see. 
it sounds like they're setting them up again for TNO2, which is totally fine with me. The the fascist believers, I guess we could say, they they wouldn't be able to go to white within 10 years. Like, it has been fascist for since, like, the 1920s, so it doesn't make any sense why would they just go away, but condemn the riots. All around, alien political extremism seems to be hell-bent on destroying our incipient democratic future. Left and right, black and red, fascist and communist extremism of all forms, shapes, and colors is taken to the streets, wrecking havoc on our cities and harming innocent Italian citizens. The vast majority of upstanding Italians is of the same opinion, that these violent operas are simply unacceptable in our society, and we must make sure that they know that the Fanfani shares the sentiment. With some help from our brave boys in the Polizia and the Carabinieri, the Carabinieri, these protests will soon be contained and Italy won't be burned by the flames of radicalism. For the love of God, please don't give me any more events. I've read like, what was it, 12 events within like 5 days? Oh my goodness. Like, like I said before, events are cool and all, but keep it maybe 1, 2 max per day. Like, if we have 1 per day, that's better than getting 3 on a single day. Like, this, that interrupts the flow a little bit too much. And then the Tokyo standoff. Has the Empire of Japan gone mad? Of course. I'm just trying to get to 1970, man. It's so difficult, apparently, to get to 1970. Ah, Starless Night. Please. Okay, it's only one event. That's good. It was after some months of uncertainty and fear, violence and bloodshed, and in some cases, hope that the autumn, hot autumn finally ended. Some had died, and some had, been, some had loved, some had fulfilled their dreams, and others had been left only with a taste of bitter disappointment. Well, the names of some would be remembered. Hundreds of thousands of the names that those affected and hurt every day by the violence and chaos on the streets would not. As Italy looked towards moving past the violence of bloodshed and entering into its promising 70s, many across the nation feel hope for the first seven months. Violence and thuggery had won out the scene, yes, but there's no key into that it had to win again. For the fathers and mothers, students and soldiers, politicians and capitalists of the kingdom, a dim light shines just above the horizon, obscured by the cloud line. Most hope it to be the dawn, but only a few truly realize what it is. A red moon rises over Italy, and soon all will look back at even the hot autumn with a sense of nostalgia. Soon the world shall change forever. We don't have that much manpower. But then again, I always cut down... Uh, our recruitable population and the Red Moon. At 4.37 p.m. inside the building of the National Agricultural Bank in Piazza Fonta, Milan, a sudden flash was seen, followed by a loud noise. At 4.38 p.m., the building was devastated with several bodies lying bloody on the floor and the cries of survivors wounded in shock loudly heard inside the building in the surrounding square. At 5 p.m., rumors spread around the city that a boiler malfunctioned and exploded in a building near the city center, causing a few deaths, and the firefighters and ambulances are now present on the scene in ever greater numbers. At 5.37, news spread that even three more explosions have been heard, this time in Rome, which however, caused no victims, and the first remnants of the TNT are found in the destroyed Piazza Fonta building. At the end of the, 12th of the day, 12th of the December, 1969, the dead started to be counted. This is 18 days late. The earliest investigation revealed that the explosion was caused by several kilograms of TNT placed inside the building by an unknown hand. The same day, a Milanese anarchist named Giuseppe Pinelli was arrested by the local police, suspected of carrying out the attack. The bodies were not even cold yet when the body, when the people and the media were already desperate to find someone to blame. After an interrogation taking place over the course of the three days, Pinelli fell from a fourth floor window in the police building, meeting his death upon the impact with the floor. The following day, what well, seems to be the culprit is finally arrested, Pietro Valpreda, another anarchist, connected to the crime scene by witness. A cab driver who allegedly transported him there sometime before the explosion and saw him carrying a large suitcase into the building, and by police reports pointing to an alleged stash of explosives found in the HQ of the anarchist cell Valpreda is part of. Now, public opinion is polarized. Some more, others cry out for the justice to come down, and yet others have already started to criticize the official narrative that is being constructed by the media. The frustration, suffering, and enthusiasm that characterize the chaotic scene or season of the hot autumn is slowly giving way to another more subtle and yet far more dangerous fe feeling fear. Terror reaps its bloody harvest. I mean, uh, now? Now? This is uh, this happened on the 12th. It's almost... Darn it, I was hoping for an explosion. Uh, I want to read another focus before doing anything else. Uh, promises of peace? That might be good. Let's do complications in the East. The Middle East is a great many things to a great many people. The original birthplace of human civilization, the homeland of the Abrahamic faiths, the crossroads between the East and the West, and its people have played both the role of conqueror as well as those of the conquered. For the modern day, its power lays just beneath the surface, and that takes the form of oil. Oil is the lifeblood of armies, of industries, and of nations, and it is our control over the Middle Eastern fields of oil fields that can provide Italy with their economic power. 
But the chaos has broken across the Middle East, starting with the civil war in Yemen, and the rebellious fever has spread to Egypt and Syria. Some of these demagogues and renegades are fueled by religious zeal, others by dreams of a single state for the entire Arab world, and while others are still simple anti-monarchist sentiment. As the entire region is thrown into a state of crisis, we'll need to act decisively to preserve our hold on the region. Calling out to the silent majority. The TV flicked on as the shop owner went out about setting up the display in the store's front window. A literal wall of TVs was presented. Dozens of different models from not only Italy but American Japan as well. Despite the disparity, one thing was consistent. On each of these scenes, a recording of the PM's speech from the last night began playing. A podium stands empty. A member of the Carabinieri stands to the left of it and a member of the Polizia to its right. The PM walked into the frame from the right. The two members began clapping as he does so. He waves to the camera. The teleprompter screen is visi briefly visible in the reflection of the glasses. He stands on the stage and smiles, a lightning and editing effect ensure that he appears more photogenic than usual. Good evening to the viewers both in the studio and at home. I'm thankful that, our, that across our humble nation, the vast majority of not only DC voters, but in fact all voters are watching. He begins, still maintaining his composure. It's undeniable that the times have been better, and some of them begin to question the very founding principles of our democracy. To these rioters and criminals within our streets, I can only offer my most sincere condemnation. If you truly wish for change, then you can... Then you, then you can institute it like a normal civilized members of the population and not as a bomb-throwing barbarian. My government has embraced a wide-ranging platform of simple common-sense solutions to the crisis at hand, and I will, if you give me just an hour of your time, explain them to you. The speech cuts off suddenly as the sword owner changes the TV's channel to the last night football's game. In such difficult times, it's best to not take a side whenever possible. A shame that was really quite the speech. Yeah, I, I saw it a little bit more for its own political maneuvering, but hey, whatever. It said that it, the economy's in the toilet, but the GDP growth has not gone down. Interest rates have not gone up yet either, so. But at least we hit 1970. Hope you're having a great year, everyone. Okay, there we go. I talk about it, and this happens. <laughs> the economic slowdown. Well, the Italian economy has never been in the best of shape ever since the Alantropa project drastically curtailed our trade. Recent events in the Middle East have not been encouraging effect. Uncertainty in the markets, coupled with rapidly rising oil prices and unrest in our sphere of influence, has slowed the economy to a crawl. As long lines begin to appear around gas stations, and shareholders sell off stocks, first cracks have started to appear. It's evident that the current crisis in the Middle East must be dealt with, and soon, before it sends our empire crashing into doldrums of an economic depression. Just keep the pumps flowing. Oh boy. Uh, before we do anything else, let's take a look. Uh, let's close it. Okay, now, there we go. We lost 5%. So, oh, it could be worse. Emergency policies? Uh, let's do promise peace. The reasons why political violence manifests are manifold, but most of them can be chalked up to economic reasons. Poor wages, increasing prices, long work hours, bad contracts, all these are problems that can be fixed by the proper economic reforms. The bad spell that has befallen us in the last few months, as well as on the way to being fixed by Fanfani, DC, and our government. So there's absolutely nothing to worry about. The Italian people should know that we are on the way to prosperity, so long as they just need to chin up to stop whining and get to work. If they can find work. And then we'll do Vatican Overtures. The Catholic Church has always been one of the most important institutions in Italy, even if, in, if indirectly, has always had a great influence on part Italian politics. While our party is entirely independent from the Vatican, we could definitely re-enter renegotiations re with them by renewing our concordat mutual obligations, reviewing the status of church-managed institutions in the country, and supporting Catholic schools, and we will be able to get the Vatican to our side. This might prove extremely useful in bringing peace to the country once more. The priest shall deliver the good word of the nonviolence and opposition to communist materialism and fascist extremism to the masses, hopefully turning public opinion even more against these radical ideologies. Cracking the atom. T minus 30 minutes, says the voice. Deep in the Sahara Desert, technicians and engineers work feverishly to finalize the preparations. Their every move watched by guards and intelligence personnel. The director is nervous. Years and years of work have been building to this, and the eyes of the nation are on him, and failure is not an option. Uh, T minus 15 minutes. Several kilometers away, in a climate-controlled bunker, King Umberto is joined by the PM, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, and a small entourage of reporters, secretaries, and bodyguards. We all look on towards a vast sandy desert in anticipation of what's to come. T-minus five minutes. The Director joins others in the bunker, apologizing for his lateness. Flash projection is distributed as the scientists run through their final checks. The last technicians vacate the test area. The last checks are completed. The preparation is finalized. All that is left is the final act. The Director begins a countdown. Five. The room is a storm of swirling emotions, fear, anticipation, and nervousness. Four. The King squashes a pressing thought. He's perfectly safe. Three. What the engineer's wipes the sweat off his brow, he won't miss this. Two. The defense minister ignores the itch in his arm, focusing his mind on the task at hand, and one. The prime minister waits with bated breath, the future of the nation in the balance. Atoms collide, and a brilliant, blinding flash lights up the Libyan desert. The mushroom cloud rising high into the sky, Italy has entered the nuclear age. Sono diventato morte, el distruttore dai mondi. Oh crap, we get more cost? Oh, this wasn't part of the deal. Oh, we can fund them now. We are working at a fast pace. Look at that. Um, sure. Anything else up here? No? You know what? More synthetic refineries? 
Why not, right? Ah, there we go. And so the clock moves, moves closer, closer to midnight. In the beginning of the new decade, we have become a nuclear power. Ah, this should surely help us provide stability to our place. Oh, crafting? Yeah. Why not? That hurts to see. That's alright, though. And then, Vatican Overtures. We're probably going to invent, and then the White Whale Ascendant. During the days, of, the darkest days of the fascist dictatorship, there was always a, tiny, a tiny light of hope. The Catholic world. The embers of Catholic cultural and political institutions, which Mussolini autocracy could never truly stamp out, would eventually coalesce into a white flower of dazzling white, D.C. Our party played a key role in transition to democracy and under Fanfani's helm. It has managed to cement its control over the country. The future looks bright, and most of the Italian population, even though who are most bitterly opposed to us, have started to get used to the idea that D.C., the White Whale, is here to stay, and will dominate Italian politics for years and years to come. Well, we'll see what happens. We can still fire the current leader. And we're still building up in, like, eastern I uh, Africa. It really sucks that we lost these guys up here. But I can't be bothered to help out in Sudan. Meeting with His Holiness. El Poporino. Oh, we can't do that one yet. Oh, we gotta go down these, these ways. So, I already read this one, so we'll, re we'll probably do that tomorrow. But meeting with His Holiness. Despite all the turbulence and no people within Italy, it was undeniable that many things remained consistent. The Catholic Church and his Pope, the Paul, Pope Paul VI, for example, had been more than willing to meet with the Prime Minister when asked. It didn't take a genius to figure out why. I found finally could ask the Pope for stability and peace within these troubled times to shore up his government, and the Pope could use a photo opportunity to stress the unity of being both Italian and Catholic, two ideas that once seemed almost irreconcilable. The meeting itself was, to put it bluntly, almost benign in its content. Both men clearly occupied elsewhere. The Pope would ask for guarantees of the government to maintain peace and ensure religious freedom, and the Prime Minister would agree. The Prime Minister would ask the Pope to make sure his flock would remain peaceful and equitable, even in the face of violence within the streets. And the Pope would, of course, agree. At the end of the meeting came the most important part, where the two emerged from St. Peter's Basilica and embraced. Tomorrow, a photo of what embrace would be on the front page of every newspaper in Italy, and accompanying it would be the newest editorial from the Pope, requesting peace not just for the sake of the government, but for the sake of humanity everywhere. His Holiness only serves to do what is right, and I'm going to continue with emergency policies. A crescent off facing Italy is unlike anything you've ever had to deal with so far. If any of these nascent movements managed to gain the upper hand against us, the political fallout would be one thing, but we would never recover from the economic damage they could do to us. We normally have a somewhat bureaucratic and light-handed policy towards handling problems in the sphere of influence, but it's such a slow and meth methodological way of doing things would only mean that we're acting too little too late as a crisis develops. Thankfully, we have a number of emergency policies set aside for just a situation. A band-aid solution until we can custom-tailor a policy that handles the source of the problem, it would at least allow us to act more decisively against the threats to Italy's interests. Very good. Contain the fire? Preventing economic collapse. They say that the sudden burst of political violence in the Middle East has been a problem would be an understating things. Our ability to import various natural resources, primarily life-giving oil in which a country runs, has been heavily hampered and requires immediate action on our part. We don't need to make the economy good or stable right away. That'll take some time. For now, though, on the other hand, we can pass through a series of simple sweeping acts that keep our essential industries working with people living cap capably, if not comfortably yet. This will give us time to figure out a more permanent solution if there is one emergency measures propaganda. The oil crisis has severely hit our country's economy, therefore the government is proposing emergency measures to balance the budget. This, of course, won't be popular with the people. The government is therefore launching a propaganda campaign to garner support for these messages. Posters are already being printed and commercials are being produced as we speak. Let's hope these measures work. We need people on our side. The oil crisis has not yet happened, though, which doesn't make any sense why it's happened. We can do this now. Weird. So I would contain the fire instead, then. Now that we've had the flexibility to manage situations as they arise, it's time that we draw our line in the sand. No more revolutionaries and rabble-rousers be able to draw the battle lines for us. We'll make them fight us on our terms, and we'll stand our ground. Cool. So we're done with our land doctrine. Thank goodness. Let's go ahead and go do some more uh, research stuff, right? Very good. We've got five more days for that, so that's not too bad. Oh, what do we have over here? Fire the current leader? Oh, I think we're kind of good for now. Economic collapse. Survey for a project. Subsidies. Our economy is taking a downward spiral, and, it won't, and if we don't do something fast, we may be looking at a nationwide scale collapse. To prevent this, we need place, some place to stop... A place to need to play stopgap measures. Firstly, to keep our companies afloat and the market running. The government is going to give subsidies to the companies most affected by the recession. This won't immediately fix things, but it'll make sure that that won't get any worse. The companies will be grateful. Hopefully. Oh, wait, hold on. Look at this. Faith in the government is 23%. Okay. Could be better. Could be worse. Um, win the home front. Contain the fire. I'm going to do that one first. And this one is survey for a project. Oh, I already did that one, technically, so. So, the road to Ridia. 
Oh, let's do this one. Watch on the borders. The Middle East is a land of borders, both on maps and off of them. Ethnic groups and tribes crisscross the colonial nation states that have been formed on top of them. As revolutionary fire and fundamental zeal spreads like a disease, we need to secure the borders against rival rousers and instigators trying to spread their message to more unreached groups. This will be this will effectively be a political quarantine, and I need to have the same level of diligence as a disease quarantine, even as a single provocateur, a provocateur makes their way across the nation's border could destabilize the entire provinces with their words and ideas. Oh, idea! You know, the most dangerous thing in the world is an idea. Dangerous, incredibly dangerous. We still have no death. Like this economic crisis, sure, it's not good for the workers. Saying we had strikes and such, but you know, it could be a lot worse. It really could be a lot worse. I like the description too. So, gaining the upper hand, the situation in the Middle East is finally going to rise and orders all but collapse. The government has decided to get involved in all this unrest so that we can come out on top of this and, and on top of the crisis. If it does not, then this can seriously harm Italy's the fourth greatest economy and, for that matter, power in the world. Let's hope for the best. Cool. And it'll stand against Baatism. More than anything, Baatis thought threatens Italy's hegemony in the Middle East. They look to cast us out of our own empire to usurp the fruits of our labor and forge it into some Arabic league of their own. Our interests and errors cannot be more directly opposed to one another, and as such, negotiation with them is impossible. Italy needs to take a stand. We will not let them gain even an inch more of ground than they have already. Stand firm, sons of Rome, and when the time is right, we'll take back what rightfully belongs to us. No falling back, no compromises, and protests begin. We're currently involved in a number of proxy wars in the Middle East, whether directly or indirectly. This needs to be this, ne this is needed to stabilize the region and get to the top suppliers of oil in the world running again. In the first few months of these proxy wars, we've seen little domestic opposition to these interventions. However, we're starting to get reports of the protests around the country advocating for no more intervention. We must end these conflicts quickly or start dealing with inter uh, with these protests. If we do not, the country might turn against us and we can no longer try to reassert our control over the Middle East. Warring developments. Light anti-war... Uh, light anti-war protests. Um, 33%. Uh, best of enemies. Nothing there. Watch of the borders. Nothing there as well. Uh, I don't see anything here, man. The government of Italy. Let's see. Uh, 51% seats in Parliament. That's good. That's good. We have a majority, which is a slight, but it's still a majority. Blood on the sand. Ooh, just in case. Maybe we'll do that one. Just because that seems like it's pretty good, just in case we want to get involved. So, while it is tempting to view the crisis we now face as a simple matter of real politics and the interests of various groups, the reality is that the conflict goes beyond simple governments and economics. This is a battle of ideologies, of convictions, of ideas and wills. Against demagogues, militaristic strongmen, and the tyranny of the masses will we stand. Italy is the last and best and only hope for democracy in the Middle East, and we owe it to not just Italy, but to the, all Arabia to protect it with all of our might. This might mean taking drastic measures, but this is a war for the very soul of the Middle East, one we cannot afford to lose. Um, nobody left behind. Ah, uh, austerity economics. Austerity economics. We'll probably have to go that one. Yeah, we have to go that one because of the way we did it stuff, so. At least there's something here. And as much as I like reading events, I kind of prefer reading focuses, just because it's a little bit more fun, at least in my opinion. Because things are changing and rapidly going on. Events just tell you, like, not necessarily, sometimes background information, but a greater context of the information, but I like the direct approach of just reading the focuses and understanding what's going on. Uh, they're among us. Oh, I haven't played that one game yet. Our colonial administrations around the Middle East are on, aren't only made up of Italians, but rather a mixed collective of Italian commissioners uh, and advisors acting in league with local bureaucracies and political elements in order to more effectively administer our sphere of influence. This served us well when the Arabs had no reason to act against us now, but now we have reason to fear that these Ba'atists and Islamic or Islamist beliefs might attra be attractive to their own collaborators. To our own collaborators, actually. It was about time we did something of an ideological audit of our colonial governments and their native leadership. We need to look at their histories, who they spend their time with, the statements that before or all of this might have seemed innocuous and hope that we put our trust in the right people. 23% still. Not bad. Make some more nuclear weaponry. Keep spending more money. Spend, 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 spend. And we actually have... Wow. Okay, we have more free civilian factories. That is not good. Because at this point, I'm probably going to start cutting uh, construction and spending down. Because there's really no point to keep it raised. Uh, actually, there is. Just because eventually... We will be able to build more, 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 which would be nice and delightful. So, in the meantime, you guys go over there, you guys go over there. Blood on the sand. Nice. Well, maybe not nice, but, you know, it is what it is. That's just suffice for now, and unchain the SIM. Can we truly expect potential traitors and saboteurs in their own ranks to have exposed themselves in the past? Can we suppose that every man and woman in speaks their, their mind, and does not simply act in their own interests, even if they may run counter to their own, own ideals? The answer is obvious, not in the least. If we're going to expose any of the revolutionary rot in our colonial administrations, we're going to need to look at more than just public statements and personal relationships. 
The SIM had the tools and expertise to perform these more invasive investigation techniques. We provided, of course, we assure them that they that we won't be prying too hard into the methods they choose to utilize in acquiring this all too important information. We put a lot we're putting a lot of faith in them, but we need to be willing to cross any boundary, overcome any obstacles that might impede us from the salvation of the Empire. And I forgot about this stuff too, but we should probably do since we are we got more than enough uh, civilian factories. And we'll end the episode soon. I'm not sure when, but we'll end it soon. Because, just because we're, we're going a little... F quite a bit farther than what I envisioned for us for this episode. But that's alright. Uh, in addition to that, we'll go over there. Loads of radar stations just because... I like radar stations. I think they're really beneficial. At least in my opinion. Everything's under control. Well, we'll see what happens. On Jin SIM. Anything else here? Nope, that's good. That's fine with me. And actually, technology is looking good too. After that shock and awe, fire and fury, the art of counterinsurgency, the impossible triangle. As if the divisions of the Middle East weren't bad enough to contend with, our own armed forces seem to be trisected in their own way, as disagreements grow and widen over how exactly we should be conducting our war against insurgency and terrorism. If we're going to actually save the Empire, not just yell at each other, we're going to need to promote one plan and put the other two down. The first camp advocates for a largely reactive and defensive plan that doesn't make or take any particularly extreme methods. The second camp argues that this is a rebellion, that we should treat this as such as any other rebellion, with making some examples and letting fear do the rest of the work for us. Their most extreme plan suggests that we treat this like a war and do not hold back whatsoever. We cannot afford to lose. After all, we get some more war support, which is good actually for us, and a little bit more manpower, which isn't too bad. So here's my question to you. Or maybe not. Maybe it's not my question. I guess piece of protection. If you'd like to read about this, go right ahead. There is fire and fury, which is okay, but we can't do that one. All we can do is shock and awe, which sucks. I would like more options, but the second camp's plan manages to convince the high command of the unfortunate necessity. These are rebels and rebellions grow, they're disaffected and disillusioned, see no downside to joining in on them. We need to remind them of the cost of their defiance and grant them the gift of self preserving fear. We are not savages, a few examples in the very public incidents should make anyone considering joining the ranks of our enemies change their minds and quickly. These incidents will be tightly controlled and we will determine the narrative leading up to the immediate leading up to and immediately following the acts. We cannot afford to lose in the field or in the papers. Which is probably a good thing. I'm gonna build a lot of air bases around here too. I wonder if you can actually directly annex puppet states in the in TNO. I've never done that before. That'd be an interesting thing to figure out. Plenty of air bases just in case. The blank training's nice. Cool. There you go. That's enough air bases for them. Shock and all. Don't mind if we do. Let time go on. Become a spy master. Thank you. And passive defense seems like a good idea. And we shall do art of counterinsurgency. Ah, more political power. Good. Uh, actually, let's get more research for going first. That's good. Let's grab some better radar, because I love radar too much. And... To protect a modern nation, state, from terrorism and insurgency, we developed a comprehensive plan that involves the active policies of SIM, the Royal Army, and local defense forces across the sphere of influence into one grand plan. Counterinsurgency is not a science. There is not one solution to every problem, and the Middle Eastern crisis has reared its ugly head in new and unique ways constantly ever since it began. So a flexible and comprehensive, ever-evolving policy will be necessary, but with the proper resources and oversight, we will see the current conflict brought to a satisfactory conclusion. Best of... Because, of course, we can't lose. We can't afford to lose. A deteriorating situation. The Iraqi president is likely dead, killed by his own countrymen. While the relationship with Qassam was never perfect, his death has thrown the country into chaos. Already unrest is reaching never-before-seen heights and rioting affects the most major population centers. Given concerns about the safety of Italian nationals, a limited evacuation has already begun for important individuals and civilian contractors. Expanding this effort to include all non-essential personnel will be drastically increased costs, but also reduce the strain on our overreached security forces. And furthermore, if things deteriorate, it would make a withdrawal from the colony significantly easier. On the other hand, we could simply extend our security detachment to preserve the safety of our citizens and assist in maintaining order, if at the cost of expanding our presence during this time of in instability. So we have this another colonial thing. Send a full security detachment to maintain stability? It's going to cost. Anyways, why should we care about Iraq? Because of oil. We have three nuclear warheads. Oh, 23% still anything up here? No, nope. uh, that's alright with me. A new bomb! Our rapidly expanding nuclear program has since produced its second device. While we are so far away from the ability to uh, be able to destroy entire countries in one fell swoop, our nuclear bombs will still make anyone think twice before daring to step on sacred Italian soil. Production on additional devices continue, and this should hopefully be only the beginning of a nuclear arsenal that would make the world tremble, even if the cost of the program is beginning to show on our annual budget. To our future success. Holy crud. Multiple... We go from single weapon to multiple weapons. Oh, I don't know if we can afford all this. I mean, hopefully we can. But, uh, I mean, for now, we definitely can, but still. Let's go and come over here and do this stuff. Max Factories instant would be nice. And we'll read one more focus before we end this episode. Which, I still want you guys to let me know, like, which one we should go. with Moderate Stronghold or this one. So, let me know in the comments below. In which we shall finish with... Oil? Why not? 
Eh, no, I don't want to do it. I want to, I want to win the home, on the home front. The disaster may have taken a place abroad, but the shadow of the process looms large over the Italian mainland. It isn't enough to put down rebellions and insurgencies in our colonial empire, but we need to, to make sure that the homeland dissent and fears don't do us in, even if we win across the Mediterranean. It's a war for hearts and minds, a war for the confidence and faith of the Italian people. To keep a hold on the people who make up our own democracy, we need to make sure that no Italian begins to waver in either their dedication or their optimism through these trying, trying times. We got 50 million in debt. That is unacceptable. But it seems like that might be the end of this episode. We have no other event. Uh, we can increase Special Forces deployment, which is okay. And we have four nuclear warheads. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow when we shall see and steer Italy into an unknown, uncertain future. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.